it was cool to watch it all in one whole series, which is like an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. But yeah, there was, again, so many things in this trip that were inspired by watching your channel. I mentioned it in these videos. So one of them was when I went to here, it's Houghton right there, Houghton. Uh, watching you with Kylie Van Dam and that interview you did, I think a year and a half ago or something like that. And that was an uh, inspiration to go there. But the whole trip was originally, ins the inspiration came from watching uh, Roy Simmons on this show and him talking about his book, Feats Pad, this beautiful coffee table book about his 21 day trip, I think around the Netherlands. So that was kind of the seed that planted it. I said, okay, I'm gonna go check it out and see what I see and have my own pilgrimage to the Netherlands. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Nick Laporte from the Nick Laporte YouTube channel. Uh, Nick the Door is the handle and uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, the origins and the genesis of his channel, getting interested in active mobility and urbanism. Uh, it's a good one and I can't wait to share it with you. So let's get right to it with Nick. Nick Laporte, welcome to the Active Towns channel. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm a big fan of this show, as you know, but maybe your listeners don't know. I've been listening for a very long time, and to be joined with you is just, it's an honor. So thanks for having me. Yeah, good stuff. Nick, you and I have had the pleasure of meeting in person. We were able to, to meet uh, in person in Amsterdam this summer, which was a, a real joy. And uh, thank you so much for listening and following along with the Active Towns channel uh, and supporting my efforts as well. You, you are one of my patrons, and I do appreciate that. Uh, but let's take this opportunity to introduce yourself uh, to the audience. So who the heck is Nick Laporte? Who the heck is Nick Laporte? That's a question I've been asking myself for a very long time. But if I could be as succinct as possible, it would be, I'm just a regular guy. I live in Vancouver, Canada, who makes YouTube videos about urbanism and micromobility. And that's, that's the short and sweet for sure. <laughs> The short and the sweet. So, so, so you're one of those Canadian guys. You're up north, north of the border. Our good friends up there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of us, right? These, the urbanist space is kind of taken over by Canadians and in certain ways. It's pretty crazy. I'm, I don't know why that's the case, but I've definitely noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, first, I want to get into the genesis of your journey uh, to all things urbanism, uh, because this isn't this isn't your your like world. I mean, this is kind of new and uh, you, you were a content creator before. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but what was really the, you know, the genesis of you starting to turn your attention towards our built environment? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but I think there's some interesting things along the way, but like most people, I just grew up in a town. I grew up in a small town, not far from Detroit, Michigan in Canada called Kingsville and it's claimed to fame as the most southern town in Canada but other than that it's just it's just a regular small town of like I don't know 10,000 people or something and uh, I learned to, to ride a bike and when you live in a small town it's a bit different than a big city because mostly you can ride places people know who you are people drive relatively slowly and it's fine uh, but when I was a teenager I actually moved to London Ontario which I'm sure many of your listeners know of London Ontario if they've never been at least and that was a, a really eye-opening experience for me because now I could ride my bike two places instead of just, you know, to school or to my friend's house. I could go to the mall. I could go anywhere I wanted and I, I could get anything I wanted on two wheels. And this is at a time where, you know, I was younger. I was a teenager and my sense of danger and doom was, wasn't as heightened as it is now. So I was willing to put up with some pretty hairy situations. Now, that being said, London was okay because they actually had some bike lanes, some grade separated bike lanes, even back then, this would have been like 2005, I think. And that was really great. I really enjoyed that. But again, I wasn't like a utilitarian cyclist or anything. It was just like a, a thing you did because that's all I could do. I, I didn't have a car transit. I'd use occasionally, but as far as cycling, I was a, a recreational cyclist. I go to the trails, you know, Fanshawe has a beautiful lake. I do laps around there on my mountain bike, but, uh, as I got older, I went to school, I became a paramedic, and I got to see a lot of the death and destruction that comes from, from cars and car dependency, a lot of traffic violence, which is eye-opening to me. And I also worked in Alberta as a medic in the oil sands. So that was a whole other side, you know, seeing the actual 
death and destruction that all of this fuel is being fed into and then seeing how wasteful we are at just pulling this stuff out of the ground. So as, as I'm going through my life, I'm just collecting all of this data, this anecdotal stuff that's pushing me in this direction. But the real start, I could say, that's like somebody who got actually interested in utilitarian cycling was a trip I made to Japan. And this was my first overseas trip. I would have been 24, I think, or 25. I did a solo trip to Japan and I decided to, to vlog it because I was always interested in YouTube and exploring that. And yeah, you're showing this video here. And this is where, this is the first time on camera I'm talking about bikes or anything. This was not my purpose to be in Japan at all. I just happened to be in Kyoto and I thought, hey, I see people on bicycles. I see bike lanes. That seems like a reasonable way to go see the sites. So that's what I did. I rented a bike and for the four days I was in Kyoto, I rode around on bike and I did the same in Osaka and it was amazing. I was like, this is pretty cool. That's cool how they do that over there. But still, my brain wasn't like, hey, maybe we can do that where I live. That didn't click yet, right? But in this video, uh, I still have a nice, uh, decent amount of hair on my head. This is before the, 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 the locks went missing. But I think I was just talking about the differences between cycling North America and Japan and how I noticed that. A, people don't wear helmets generally in, in Japan. I thought that was interesting. And I was talking about the sidewalks and how people ride their bikes on the sidewalks, even though there are bike lanes too. If there wasn't a, a bike lane, pe people were perfectly legal and happy riding on the big, wide uh, pathways for pedest pedestrians and cyclists. And the last thing I noticed there was how few people locked their bikes to anything. And I thought that was very interesting. All you had to do was, you know, put the lock on the wheel and park it and you're fine. I thought that was cool. But again, like I said, it was kind of just this thing. That's just this foreign thing that they do in Japan. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to experience that again. It was cool. So just one year later after that, I had my first chance to go to Amsterdam. And this is, again, just another leisurely trip. This was had nothing to do with making YouTube videos. And I was with my my girlfriend at the time. And we went to Amsterdam for three or four days. And again, like everybody does, you rent a bicycle and you tour around the city, and the same thing. This is really cool, but again, did not click in my head. This is maybe something that we can do in North America. And this photo here, that's me. That's with my my girlfriend at the time, uh, riding through Vondel Park, I believe, in Amsterdam. I, I recognize her. You recognize her? Yeah, I, I recognize <laughs> that smiley face, yeah. <laughs> She's not a public person, so I'm not going to put her face on the internet. But, but Amsterdam was a, a great experience then. We had some really wonderful times. But again, moving on. So a year after that, one year, it's like one year after another, my girlfriend, that same person in that photo there, was like, I want to move to Vancouver. You know, we're living in London. And she's like, I want to move to Vancouver. She's been there, been here a bunch of times. And I was like, sure, why not? looks beautiful. Let's check it out. So my first time coming to Vancouver was moving here. And that was seven years ago now. And that was another shift, right? Because now I got to see what in the context of North America would be a relatively good place for cycling and cycling infrastructure. And the culture here was, it was almost a little bit of a shock coming from London, Ontario to Vancouver to see just how much they've built out their infrastructure. And that was incredible because Immediately, I became a fair weather cyclist and micro mobility user. If the weather was nice, I'd get on my bike and I'd go to work. And I was like, this is nice. It feels good. And this, this is something that I think a lot of people don't experience, even within North America. And it's, it comes, touches on that whole fact of when you, when you talk to people about micro mobility or even just getting on a bicycle and experiencing that on your day to day life, going to work, going to uh, the restaurants or just to a store to pick things up. I'm like, you need to, you need to get your, your feet over here, check it out, try it out, get on two wheels, roll around and just experience what that that's like. So, so yeah, I, I, I just think people need to actually experience that, but I was happy to experience that. But for years, it, it still was only, it still was only a fleeting thing. I could say it was, it was something I did, like I said, as a fair weather cyclist, but I it never really was truly won over buy the bicycle full time. Uh, when the weather was bad, when it was winter time, I would get on the bike or sorry, I would get on the, the bus or I'd get in my car sometimes to go to work. But the real, the real moment, the real watershed moment that pushed me over the edge was an electric 
scooter. So some of my colleagues at work, two of them actually rode electric scooters occasionally to work. And I thought that was cool. One of them offered to let me try it. I rode it around the parking lot. And that same day, I bought one because I was like, this is so much fun. Like, I want to do this more often. And that was the thing that motivated me to do that. And that was a, another shift here. And this was definitely the, 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 the winning moment where I was like, this, this is it. This is it. I became a full-time micro-mobility user. The only time my car ever left the garage was when we had to leave the city and go long distances. That's it. So I'd go to work every day on my electric scooter or my bicycle. I'd go to the store. I'd even go to home hardware or, you know, Home Depot and pick up big things on my scooter because I was like, why not? I don't want to have to drive. Like, that's just a pain in the butt. And that was, uh, yeah, that, that, that was uh, the real watershed moment for me that really sent me in this direction that if you're watching this, you'll see me now is that I've been making these YouTube videos about microbility and ur urbanism for the past few years. So it first started as just my, my channel just started as electric scooters, how to fix them, reviews, things like that. And I thought that was the direction I was going to go, but I'm a pretty wishy-washy person. And that's probably why my YouTube channel has, is, and still, and will always be just my name because I wanted room to breathe and to pivot. Yeah. yeah. And my well, initial... Let's, let's pause yeah, for yeah. a second here because it, this is not your first time. This is not your first rodeo when it comes to, to, to YouTube because the reality is, is that you had a, uh, a very, I want to say very successful, you say moderately successful, uh, but you had a, a, a channel that, you know, had, I don't know, 40 some odd videos or whatever. Um, this video right here has 2.3 million views. I think you had some 40,000 subscribers on your tech illiterate channel. And so yeah, picking up the camera, even as early as your first visit to Japan, you know, in 2015, you just started filming, you know, <laughs> you know, it's probably your cell phone, but you, you just started filming. There's, a, there was a natural inclination uh, to document stuff. So take us back to, you know, tech illiterate and, and the fact that you, you do have this inclination to sort of document what it is that's going on in that head of yours. Yeah, I think like many people might have experienced in their own life, I'm sure a few people, at least on YouTube, is that I had an interest in making videos from a young age. Like I remember when we were kids way back in Kingsville, getting this really crappy little camera where we could make just silly videos of us riding our bikes or stop motion videos. And I always found that interesting. When YouTube came around and whatever it was, 2006 or seven or whatever it was around that era, that era, I was immediately hooked. I've always been watching YouTube videos ever since then. And have continued to watch YouTube videos. Uh, and by the way, those those videos from Japan, that one that we showed, was just like a vlog. And it's actually available still on my Nick Laporte YouTube channel. It's just hidden. They're unlisted videos in a playlist. That if you go to the uh, playlist, got it. Band, I okay. think they're still there. But well, if it's not, if it's fine, we I'll, I can I can put the <laughs> the the URL uh, in the show notes for this video. Uh, you mentioned Kingville again. I want to uh, bring that up uh, simply because, yeah, you're right. I was like, where the heck is that? You're right. It's like so far south. It's yeah. right near where uh, Point Pelee National Park is that, you know, kind of points down into, uh, you know, which probably should this pr probably should all be, you know, U.S. territory. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's actually but, more south than I think 30% of the contiguous United States. Yeah, it's yeah. If we pull back, you can kind of see that. But what I really wanted to point out is that, yeah, it, this is a stone's throw from Motor City, from mm -hmm. Detroit. Automobile Central. There you go. I, yeah, we'll continue with what we were talking about before. But actually, I was in Detroit just uh, last Wednesday. I was visited with the Greenways Coalition to talk about the Joe Louis Greenway. I got a bike tour and they're doing great things there. I'm really they excited. Are, they really the are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I've, uh, I've had a chance to visit there a couple of times, um, prior to launching this channel, uh, and, and, and did produce some videos, uh, on that process. The, uh, Dekinder cut, which is going to be part of that Joe Louis Greenway, the, the circle, uh, path that's going in. I like to say that, one of the interesting things about Detroit is that when you really zoom into Detroit and you and you realize just how overbuilt the 
you know, the, the city was and, and you look at, um, the fact that many, and you probably noticed this while you were there, many of those downtown streets are just massively over wide and there's so few cars. Um, the population of Detroit now is about a million people less than it was at its peak, you know, back in the 1940s, 1950s, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, then they lost population at a big route. So the on-street network can totally be developed out because they've got all this unused space uh, on the streets that can be reimagined. Their biggest challenge is they're, you know, they're still broke. <laughs> you know, they, yeah. <laughs> they, they were in bankruptcy. Uh, they're one of the few cities to, to go into bankruptcy. But yeah, it's been wonderful following the story of the pathway network that's being developed out. And Detroit is really having a, a wonderful resurgence. So it's a, a really nice success story. People are starting to move back into the downtown area, uh, even more so than probably we've seen in the last five to six decades. So it's beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful to see. I'm, again, I'm really, really excited. The Dequinder Cut is one of those things when you see it, you're like, this is, this is fantastic. Like that Crosstown Greenway in Minneapolis. Very similar, right? Rails to trails. It's, if you haven't been to Detroit ever, might be worth checking out if you're not far away. It's actually, it's really coming along. And if you're into sports, great sports city, I'm just saying. <laughs> Go Lions. <laughs> um, so... And so, so I do want to bring us back around to micromobility and you've got uh, on your, 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 your video, your list of videos here, side by side, we have, uh, what is micromobility and, uh, in, in all of the various micromobility videos that we had seen, you know, earlier, um, we, we finally get our first bike lane type video here. Uh, not a bike lane. <laughs> this is not a bike lane. Why? and why we need them. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, but yeah, what is micromobility? So what is micromobility to you? What does that, what does that definition mean? Because it's a very specific term, but that term means different things to different people. Exactly. I was just going to say it's a personal thing that at the end of the day, micromobility is a personal thing. The top down definition is Vehicles that are electric or human powered that weigh less than 500 kilograms and generally don't go over 45 kilometers per hour. But that is like, that's a massive net. That is huge. So, so Horace Dedu, he's the guy who coined the term micromobility. I think he's part owner or runs micromobility.io. He kind of refined it for his definition to basically say it's the smallest device that you could, you know, practically ride. You know, what's, what's the human, the, the device built around the human? That's, that's what micromobility is. And I really like that because with the other definition, the technical definition, that could be like a Fiat 500, at least if it's electric or, you know, Flintstone powered, but that's, that doesn't make sense. It's like, if I'm riding to work every day, that's a pretty big vehicle. I don't need that. So I like the idea that it's basically the smallest practical vehicle to get the job done. That's what I like. Yeah. And, and I will include the link uh, to this video so that folks can go through and, and watch this and, 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 and kind of understand this. I'm, I'm kind of of the mindset, too, that it, it is kind of broad. It doesn't have to be just the e-scooters because in what has happened, um, especially when the e-scooters got sort of dumped on our streets um, in whatever that was, 2007, 2008 or no, 20. 17, 2018, a decade later. Yeah, that, that just kind of, it, it put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths as, you know, the e-scooters were being dropped at the same time the, the dockless bike share bikes were being dropped. Remember those dockless bike oh, share yeah. bikes? Yeah. yeah. Yep. The non-electric ones. And so that was, that was kind of part of, I think a lot of, you know, it, it was termed as, you know, micromobility is going to save the world and blah, 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 and micromobility and it's dockless scooters. And, and, and of course, all of that hype kind of went through its, you know, phases and et cetera. And the business models of those uh, firms that, uh, you know, dropped so many of them, millions and millions of these units onto our streets. Uh, I think that there's really only two or three 
of those original brands still standing, <laughs> you know, bird, uh, uh, lime, limes around, um, you know, super pedestrian, which is a very well run company. They, they folded. And so, yeah, so it, it, it's the, the interesting thing is, is your, your orientation to it based on your, your videos that I'm seeing here was really towards that, that personal privately owned source of an e-scooter versus the the shared e-scooter concept that in micromobility solution that was going to save the world is that kind of um a, a correct assumption based on what i'm Absolutely. seeing here yeah that's spot on yeah i I am a fan of shared stuff. Dockless, absolutely not. That's like my stance. I'm like, no dockless, please God, no dockless. Like they're they're talking about bringing scooters to Vancouver. We don't have them here. We just have the shared bikes and e-bikes, which are docked. Thankfully, they're planning on having them docked or something, but they still haven't arrived. Either way, I'm so not no, even really a fan of Explain your position e-scooters. on that. Explain your position on that. Why not dockless? Why not dockless? Because... When it comes to shared things in general, it can attract antisocial behavior to begin with. But when you give people the option to place something wherever they want, inevitably, it's going to end up in the way of people who are walking and especially people who are rolling who need that accessibility right in the middle of the sidewalk. Just bad news. That, like, that's a full stop for me. So that's, that's my main gripe with them. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So... Earlier, you also sort of channeled um, the fact that you you made that move, uh, you know, to, to London, Ontario, and you also alluded to the fact that you know all you, you Canadians that are you know kind of taken over the YouTube world, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's a, that's kind of a bit, of, you know, there's there's sort of some sort of trend. There's something in the water up north there, uh, where you're at. I'm going to pull up the map here so that we can give folks uh, a bearing as to where London is. I knew where London was mainly because uh, a very good friend of mine from when I was at graduate school at U of M over here in Ann Arbor, boom, right there in the center of the screen, I was doing my graduate work there. And then my buddy, he lived in London and he was attending Western Ontario. So he was at the the, the university there in, in London. And so I, I visited London. I made a, a trek. I drove from, you know, over the Windsor Bridge and, and or whatever the heck that's, uh, you know, called Ambassador Bridge or whatever it is, yep. and, uh, and made my trek uh, over to London and visited London uh, at least once, maybe twice. I can't really remember. This was way back in the 1980s, so it was a long time ago. Um, but what what kind of is interesting about Ontario as a province is, and I've had this conversation before with with other folks on the channel, is that what we're seeing around London here is a whole lot of farmland. And in fact, my friend John, his parents, that's what they did. That's that's they were farmers. They had, you know, you know, hundreds of acres or hectares or whatever you guys call them up, up north of the border, uh, you know, growing crops and, and all of that. But then, then you have your, your cities, um, expand a little bit more. You, you talked about it and you highlighted a little bit of what was good about London from a a kid's perspective and an adolescent's perspective and the active mobility that you were able to participate in. And then we'll we'll take a look at the criticisms of of fake London that we have here on screen. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like I said, when I at the time when I was a teenager, I was not risk averse, like many young men are. I would just bike anywhere, and even though we did have some bike lanes, a lot of the times you end up in places where they don't exist, and that's still the case today. So it is changing. And there are things that I really like about it, especially the TVP. It's a cross town greenway, and it's still one of one of the most beautiful greenways I've ever ridden in North America. Still, like it's it is so beautiful. It goes along the Thames River. It's so lush and green in the summer, and it can be actually a great connection if it's along the way to the places you're going. Yeah, completely yeah. car free. Yeah. So you did a, a sort of a reply to, to Jason, uh, Jason Slaughter with Not Just Bikes. Uh, he's, of course, is from London. And it was part of 
his journey and he and his wife's journey um, of, you know, deciding to, to, to leave uh, Ontario. They were at the time, even though he grew up in London, he at the time they were living in the suburbs of, of Toronto. And uh, they're like, yeah, we don't want to raise our kids here in North America. We want to pull up stakes and because they, they have that privilege. They have the ability to do that. They had been living internationally as a couple for a while. And now that they had young kids, they're like, we want something better for the kids. And so they decided uh, after an extensive search and folks, if you're interested in that story, um, I interviewed Jason about the origins of how they came to that decision. And so it's a, it's a fascinating, um, uh, you know, sort of chronicling of, of the decision process that took place, but he does poke fun at, uh, at London fake London, <laughs> Ontario, from time to time. Yeah. And so it looks like you decided to, to head back and kind of give a critical eye of the good and the bad of yeah. what it's really like there in London. With that new sort of vision, because now you're looking at this through a different set of goggles, mm -hmm. um, because you've already kind of gone a, a little bit into the uh, the whole of like thinking about these things in a different way. Um, what year was this that you did the, the, the visit back this to was the... only a year ago, this video. Okay. So and... this is a year ago. Yeah. And so, um, you hadn't yet really, really gone down the rabbit hole big time, but you, you're definitely no, sliding no, no. your way down. No, yeah. no, the, the turn had happened at this point. And to clarify this, this video, it is a bit clickbaity, but it was, it, the, the premise of the video that I, I went in with was to give more context to London, Ontario for people who have never been there or their only exposure to it was from watching Jason's videos. Because a lot of people who are interested in this, they're going to be watching Jason because his channel is massive. I, I have watched a lot of his videos. It's how one of the reasons why I got into this in the first place. So I agreed with so many of his points, but there was a few that I disagreed with. Sure. Mainly like I already talked about being stranded as a, a teenager, I didn't feel that at all. That was, again, my experience because there are bike, bike lanes. You can see them right there in that footage there uh, beside the sidewalk. They're not great, but they are grade separated. They're terrible, but they are grade separated. They're better than gutter bike lanes, that's for sure. So I highlight that. I highlight the TDP, the things I liked. But I also confirm a lot of things that he does talk about. Like there are a lot of places where bike lanes just end. They're, the transit is bad. It's terrible. It comes super infrequently. I had terrible experiences when I was in college getting to school on the bus. So it was more just opening the window a bit wider for people who are interested in learning about fake London. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting too, and, and, and I have to credit Jason and, and he's been so kind to me of, of coming on the channel multiple times is that I had no real appreciation for how powerful that is to, you know, to interview somebody who has a big following. And boy, did I learn that. I mean, because it was like, I, the next thing I knew, I caught a tiger by the tail and I'm like, holy moly, this whole YouTube thing, this is where I should be focusing my energies. Because up until that very first interview with him in July of 2021, this was primarily an audio only podcast. And so that was really the thing that I was like, you know what, this is a visual medium. This is a very visual thing that we're talking about, this urbanism stuff and active mobility stuff. I really, it, it makes way more sense to be in this platform where we're, we're, we're talking and we can integrate some vi visuals. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this right now and your audio only, hey, I love you. We're, we're going to do our best to, uh, to not isolate you and, and, and all that. I mean, but the, the reality is as much of what we end up talking about is very visual in nature. And so the video uh, world, the format really, really... Um, has helped out a great deal with that. And so, yeah, I was just blown away by, you know, talking about that. So you mentioned clickbaity, you made the, the, the thumbnail very much like the, uh, you know, one of his, uh, thumbnails. And then the, the, the little logo was not, not just bikes. Yeah. And I goofed <laughs> right. on it in the intro, you know, he has that yeah, yeah. aerial footage of, uh, Amsterdam and it's, you know, the bike yeah. bell and it's beautiful sound. I made, you know, the awful sound of the, the strodes, loud yeah. strode and the horn of the yeah. truck going by. 
Yeah. Now, as much as as you as you put a lot of effort in that, and and it was really it's very very it's very well done, and and I congratulate you on that. But it's not your best video. Your best video is 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 actually just changed. It was should we we tax cyclists Uh, a week? What was it? A week ago? Two weeks ago? That you and I when I was on your uh, your your podcast over at Radio Free Urbanism. Radio yeah. Free Urbanism, and we'll be yeah. sure to have the link uh, to Radio Free Urbanism in there as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm remembering that. Correct. It was, should we tax cyclists was the, the top viewed. But I said, hey, watch this other illegal in Japan, cycling in Japan is different, uh, that you posted two months ago. I told you, I said, I, it's fast charging. It's going to eclipse your, your number one video. And it did. It did. You were right. It's still moving. Yeah, it's yeah. still moving. I, I, love I love it. Japan. I could always talk about Japan. I wish I could just make a YouTube Japan channel about Japan and move there, but that's not ideal. <laughs> but, um, I want to come, come right back to this, but if we can roll back a bit, because there's, there's something very important I want to talk about, and it's about motivations. So originally when I started making this YouTube channel, it was about the scooters, right? And I wanted to angle it in a way to highlight the bottom-up motivations that would make people switch or get people interested in it and the things that motivated me to move on a scooter or a bike. And that was my main motivation. And you see some of the videos are about how much it costs, right? How much electricity does it use? Stuff like that. And the main things I focused on was it's fun. A, it's just so much fun. Like if you've ridden an e-bike, if you've ridden a bike, you know, it's fun, but riding an e-bike or an e-scooter game changer, so much fun. It can save you tons of money, right? which is awesome. You think about all the money you have to spend on just buying a car and upkeeping it, the amount of gas you have to put in the thing and how get moving to micromobility can help your mental health and your physical well-being. But even after digging into those things and talking to people, you know, I still have lots of friends back in Ontario who are very, you know, I don't know if we want to use the the, the word here, but car-brained, extremely car-brained, conservative type people who I love, but I'm trying to explain to them why I do this, you know, what are the things that motivate me to do this? And it, they can understand it. They understand that it can save the money. They understand that it can make them healthier. They understand that it's fun, right? But I realized the key motivator to get people from switching the way they move around their city is making it easy. And that's it. And that's it. And that's when I started switching. And that's when I made that video, this is not a bike lane. And that's when I started getting into the activism here in Vancouver because I realized the built environment is the thing that gets people to move. Because the reason why I got on my scooter wasn't because, oh, I love the environment. I love saving money. It's because it was easy. It's because my, my commute is uphill, which on the way back is great on a bike. On the morning, I'm not a morning person, not a fan, right? <laughs> so it made it easy. And it's the same amount of time driving versus getting on my scooter. And that was the difference. That's it. So that's what I wanted to do. I'm privileged enough that I have the at least good enough infrastructure where I could get to work without dealing with almost any cars, right? So I wanted to help at least push the needle a little bit in a direction where other people can experience that too, or at least just have that opportunity. And that's what we need to change is our built environment to make it an easy choice to change the way we move. Yeah. It's a very interesting inflection point too, as you mentioned, you know, you, you, you did uh, the not a, this is not a bike lane video, and then you know a f- few videos later you did fake London, and then after that it's pretty much all just infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think you I don't think you have another e scooter in here. Nope. Yeah. I just maybe the one I think it was like why I ride an e scooter, which again was just talking about the motivations why. Yeah. I, take that over an e-bike and oh yeah there it is boom yeah better better than an better than a bike question mark question mark yes there's a nice clickbaity one yeah is it it? like i don't know you tell me you're talking about before it's it's about personal choice the thing that fits your life and that's the one that currently fits my life for again i still have a bicycle which i ride quite frequently but yeah it's one of the things i use have you um have you done the e-bike commute up that hill no i would love to I would love yeah, to. Yeah, I think again, that would be an in, that would be an interesting sort of like comparison is is get you on a nice electric assist bike, not a throttle bike, but an electric assist bike, one that can carry you know some some more. You mentioned you know carrying stuff on your on your scooter, you know get you a nice you know 
electric assist bike where you can, you know, carry significantly more weight than you can on your scooter uh, if you ever need to or want to as part of your your daily routines, et cetera. And I wonder how, because you mentioned that hill of, you know, sort of flattening or eliminating that hill with an electric assist, high quality electric assist bike. Um, and then you think it's fun riding a scooter downhill. It's even way more fun <laughs> riding a bike, <laughs> I think. Um, but yeah. Well, let me tell you this. If Okay, and this is, I'm throwing this out there to the world right now. If any reputable brand making, you know, good e-bikes with good batteries, send, drop me, drop me a line. I'd be happy to take a bike, do a review, and that be my main transportation. But I just can't justify getting rid of my scooter. It's still working, right? So that's my the main thing. Uh, but I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're a powerful influencer now. So, I mean, what the heck? I mean, we, we <laughs> need to, you. yeah. I mean, and, and let's talk a little bit about that because- when we were together in Amsterdam and we were, we were talking about your most uh, popular videos and, and, and again, at the time, uh, the should, should we tax cyclists was, uh, at, at the top, even then, uh, during the summer, uh, you were at less than 9,000 subscribers, as I recall at that time. And you've bumped up another 3000 subscribers. You're closing in on 13,000 subscribers on this channel. Um, it's, it, it's, and, and again, I want to emphasize the fact that you're doing this on the side. This is just a passion project. You've, you've got a real job, full-time job that you're doing. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm with you. I, I think a, a brand should be like, heck yeah, I want to get him on a high quality uh, uh, electric assist bike. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Bosch system. Uh, so any of the bikes, high quality bikes that are that are using the Bosch uh, powertrain system, it's UL certified, um, safe batteries, et, et cetera. So um, I've interviewed them before you can go into, I'll, I'll include the link in the, in the show notes for that interview of the North American uh, marketing um, chief uh, for Bosch. Uh, and then I've also interviewed um, Josh Hahn with Turn. Uh, talking about the power of e-bikes and especially the power of uh, electric assist cargo bikes. So I'm a huge fan too. They're, yeah, they're fantastic. Again, <laughs> if I get, if I can get my hands on one, that's going to be my, I, e-bikes are my favorite, like hands down. If I could, if comfortably, they are the one, like I love riding e-bikes so much. So that's definitely the top for me, but as you were saying about my channel, having this inflection, this, you know, like you said, catching a tiger by the tail was a recent trip that I got to take to Europe, which was kind of serendipitous. We were just planning to go visit, visit our friends in Germany for a week. My wife was going to see Taylor Swift with her friend in Amsterdam. And that was it. But I was like, we're already flying there. So I was like, I'm going to go two weeks early and go do my own thing, do some filming around Europe because it's been a while since I've, you know, flew over the Atlantic. So let's go. So the first thing I did was fly to Amsterdam and I did a little bike tour. It was uh, not very far as the commenters have, have, have pointed out and that I didn't really bike around the Netherlands. That's just Randstad. That's Holland. But anyway, <laughs> I biked for about six days. It was about 305 kilometers all in with, with the tooling around the cities. Yeah, I started in Amsterdam and did a loop back to Amsterdam. And it was fantastic. I didn't know what was going to come out of it. I had planned to make a bunch of solo videos, like just a video about Houghton. And then I'd go to Rotterdam and make a video about Rotterdam. But it turned into this hybrid vlog, uh, kind of uh, just highlighting these different places through the vlog instead. And that just seemed like the better flow from all the footage that I had. So that's what I did. I made this, this six day, six video biking around the Netherlands trip. And in the end, I'm very, I'm very happy with how it turned out. Again, you're a video creator. You know how it feels when you put out a video. You look at it a week later. Oh, I could have changed that or this, and it could be better this way. But overall, really well. And yeah, it. As far as my channel is concerned, they it exploded. Yeah, and I mean, when you when you really look at this too, I mean, I want to emphasize again, you've got thirteen thousand, just shy of thirteen thousand subscribers, but your top performing video from your uh, from your six video suite series of your ride uh, around the, uh, the, the Holland area, um, provincial area there in the Ronstadt, um, it's like at 94,000 views already a month in. 
Yeah. Again, no, another I- fast charging video. Uh, it's going to it's going to eclipse 100,000 very, very soon. Maybe um, that will be number one. <laughs> yeah. And that it, it very well could be. And what's really cool about the way that you package these things and the way that you did the these videos was that you also clearly were able to tap into the juggernaut that is the Dutch viewers. Yes. Um, the, and, and this is, uh, again, something we can credit, uh, you know, Jason for and not just bikes. The Dutch are incredibly fascinated how fascinated we are with what they consider just normal life. Yeah, the ability to just get around. Yeah. And, and they're just like, why are you guys so fascinated with this? And then they see our take on them. Uh, some of us are, are producing stuff like myself, you know, I'll, I'll tap into my professional background and give my take, you know, as a health prom- promotion professional and the, you know, sort of the, the behavior change perspective of, of the built environment and how that is, is impacting things. Others will give their take, you know, from like an infrastructure expert perspective and, and then others will give their, their take of just let this feels wonderful. And I'm looking at this, this is great. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing and you just got to ride that wave because it's a fun wave to be in. And, uh, yeah, I mean, your, your worst performing of the six has 46,000 views. I mean, that's just fantastic. Congratulations, man. Oh, thank you so much. And I have to credit the people who are watching because that's what drives it in the first place. And it really surprised me. You know, I knew about this effect again that's how jason started his channel he realized that there were so many local people in the netherlands who were watching his video and that helped it explode and i expected just to make the one video and be like yeah we'll throw that out there and then i can start working on the real stuff right but as the response from the first one went i was like okay i gotta roll with this so i pumped them out as fast as i could which was once a week and uh when i was finally done could take a breath for a minute and then started looking to the next thing, what I'm going to work on. But yeah, yeah. I'm very happy with it. And it was, uh, it was cool to watch it all in one whole series, which is like an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. But yeah. There was again, so many things in this trip that were inspired by watching your channel. I mentioned it in these videos. So one of them was when I went to here, it's Houghton right there, Houghton, uh, watching you with Kylie Van Dam and that interview you did, I think a year and a half ago or something like that. And that was an uh, inspiration to go there. But the whole trip was originally, in, the inspiration came from watching uh, Roy Simmons on this show and him talking about his book, Feats Pad, this beautiful coffee table book about his 21-day trip, I think, around the Netherlands. So that was kind of the seed that planted it. I said, okay, I'm going to go check it out and see what I see and have my own pilgrimage to the Netherlands. So it was it was eye-opening and I am so happy I did it. But Again, I can't wait till I go back. I think I have to go again next summer and do a whole other trip to whole different places that people aren't generally thinking about when they think about the Netherlands and the cycling infrastructure, Yeah, at least from the outside world. Yeah, and and we're recording this on uh, September uh, 10th uh, on on a Tuesday, and uh, I released another video with Kylie. She was gracious enough to take me on a, a wonderful guided tour of Houghton and being able to like, you know, get out there and see what that was, what the city was, is like to be able to ride on it. And I had the opportunity to, to have Billy Fields, Professor Billy Fields from Texas State University along with me. And it was his very first time of experiencing it. So it was neat for me to film and just see his eyes just go like this and how he was able to experience that. And, um, and so for folks, if you, if you're not sure exactly what we're talking about with this whole Houghton thing, check these videos out, Ch- check out, you know, this video that Nick put together, then watch the, uh, the tour video that I did with, uh, Kylie and, and release today. Um, and it'll give you an idea, but this overhead right here is a great little visual, um, of, I think what makes, you know, Houghton so special is that, you know, this was an intentionally designed community and they really wanted to de-emphasize the, the automobile. Let me try to get that graphic to stay there. Boom. Here we go. That's what we wanted to do. Explain a little bit about the gold pathways that you have highlighted here and, and what the relevance is. 
So what I meant to do, so for the audio listeners, I'll try to explain to them. So Houghton is encapsulated in this figure eight uh, ring road, right? And what they intended to do was make it this bicycling city from the start from, I think it was the 70s when it began, uh, they began building it. And what they did was that they, the intention was to build for the bicycle first, right? So what they did was build these great routes all for bicycles, but the, what they did in that was build blockades, basically, modal filtering where cars can't pass. There's no legal way and sometimes even physical way for them to cross these. So many of these are greenways, beautiful greenways, like I talked about the TVP in, in London, Ontario. These are nicer, but they're not in North America. That was the qualifier I had earlier. And some of these are absolutely beautiful. The North is so beautiful. Oh, my God. Just ride it. You could ride back and forth along that path and just be like, you make your day. It's so nice green. There's ponds. There's, it's just, it was such a lovely place. But, yeah, this is essentially to make it easy for, for people on bicycle or on foot to move around the city and make it more difficult or at least give some friction to people who want to drive. And it's funny hearing the pushback on this, and I even saw it in the comments on this video and some Dutch people saying like, oh, it's so hard to drive there. It's such an, an annoyance. Like, why can't they just make it easier for driving? And it's, it comes back to the point. It's like, if you make it easier for driving, Houghton's not going to be that small. It's going to be a lot bigger, and there's going to be a lot more traffic, and you're basically going to get any other bedroom town you have in North America. That's This is the magic there. If you don't want to live there, I'm sure there's other places you can live that cars are more, you know, catered to. Yeah, yeah. There's an old saying, you can prioritize people or you can prioritize cars, but you can't prioritize them both successfully. And so yeah. it's, it's a decision. And so the car has been tamed in the sense that, yes, many of these residences that we see here on, on screen, uh, many of them do own automobiles and they're able to access their private residence and park. But then the circulation plan is if they want to get to school, if they want to get to the downtown area, if they want to catch the train, the easiest way to do so is to get on your bike and ride there. And, and you kind of highlight that with, you know, some of the, the diagrams and the routes and, and all of mm-hmm. that through here. Yeah. I think the best one was if you could just do this yourself, go to Google maps, go to Houghton, it's just by Utrecht and just put down a point and then select the car and just kind of drag the other point around and just see how that routing changes and then do the same with the bicycle. And you can see the stark difference between the two, like <laughs> the car, you'll be like, you could be neighbors and then you have to go take like a 10 minute drive just to drive to your neighbor's house in some cases when you, you could walk one minute. So it's, it's about encouraging people. It's about taking, or at least looking at mobility as this behavioral psychology experiment almost. Right. And it comes back to the thing I said, making it easy for people to do it encourages people to do it. Right. It's not the motivations about the cost and stuff like smokers know that, that smoking kills them. Right. But that's not the motivation that gets them to quit smoking. Right. I feel like it's very similar with, with mobility. One of the things that I wanted to emphasize too on this and and people have heard me, uh, Uh, talk about this a lot on the channel is that this is not about cyclists. It's not about the, the cyclist word, the, the vision that comes up in your mind when you hear cyclist, when you look at this network, the cycling network here, this is about mobility. You just use that word. This is about mobility options and choice. One of the things that I just love about riding around in Utrecht, in Delft, in Houghton, in parts of, of Amsterdam, is you just see all of the different layers and types of active mobility that are taking place, you know, including people in adaptive cycles, people in wheelchairs, in mobility devices. And you see that in spades when you're, when you're, you know, on these streets in Houghton, you're seeing, you know, like literally people who would be limited for walking, maybe only a few meters, but once they get on their bike, they can roll and go for, for many, many kilometers, many, many miles. When they get on their mobility device, they can get to their doctor's appointment. They can get to the grocery store. They can go about life. And I think that that is worth mentioning is that this isn't about bikes. It's not about bikes at all. It's about mobility options and choice and de-emphasizing the unlimited reign of the automobile. Now, I've got it freeze-framed right here on the fact that 
automobiles exist here in, in Houghton. I mentioned that earlier. This is a Fiestrat. This is a shared street that is in red uh, pavement. It is prioritized uh, as a bicycle priority street, but cars are allowed traveling 30 kilometers per hour or less because this person is trying to get to their destination, which is most likely they're either going to or coming from their private residence, their driveway. Talk a little bit about this, because this is one of our passions, mutual passions that we have about shared spaces, the Fietstraat, uh, edge lane roads, and these other treatments that we see over in the Netherlands that they do so well, but we're having such a hard time doing them well over here in North America. Absolutely. Yeah, this has definitely become one of my main passions when it comes to infrastructure is the lack of infrastructure almost in some cases. So like you said, the feed strat is a, is a street that is prioritized for bicycles and cars are guests. It's low speed. It's safe. It's AAA infrastructure for the most part. It's paired with good modal filtering so that the people who are driving on there, generally their destination is going to be on that street for the most part. Yep. Okay. You just used a word, so you're going to have to define it. You said AAA infrastructure. AAA infrastructure, all ages and abilities. Essentially, it's a place where people eight, year old, eight years old to 80 years old would be safe riding there. If you don't want your eight-year-old riding there, it's not good enough. That's basically the, the AAA infrastructure. Yeah, so that's Feedstrat is one of them that I think is very interesting. And I think that should be basically the bulk of the infrastructure that we have in Vancouver or any city. It's the taking your local streets and making them safe places for thoroughfares for anybody, no matter what they're they're riding. If it's going to be on a bicycle, they're walking, they're on one of those crazy one wheel uh, electric unicycle thingies. It's a it's a safe place, and that's that was where the start of my interest in the infrastructure in Vancouver really came from. Because we do have really beautiful separated bike lanes. We have this beautiful seawall. There's some really really safe and good bike lanes downtown. But where it really falls apart is the local bikeways in which we have basically some paint on the ground and a sign on the side of the street that says this is a bicycle way. It's, it, I don't even know what to call it. They call it bikeways or bike route, but there's physically nothing really different between a lot of these, between those bikeways and the next street. There's almost nothing different. There's tons of cars, tons of cars parked on the side. There's people speeding. I bring my speed gun out there sometimes and some of these, You'll easily get car after car after car going over 50 kilometers per hour. That is not AAA infrastructure. And that's my main gripe. So the feed strat's one of those examples that could be used. Uh, edge lane roads is another one that can also be used on slower streets, arguably sometimes busier streets. Uh, or just having local streets that are have brick pavers and plenty of modal filtering. Like I've seen, I think Harlem was one place where I saw a lot of that, where it was very explicit modal filtering really slow traffic uh, with bump outs, parking sometimes where it's useful because it can be useful in slowing traffic. But yeah, it's, it's, it's about making that the backbone of our network. It's, it's again, like bike lanes are beautiful. I love beautiful bike lanes. They're great to see. They're really encouraging, but where we really need to work on is the low hanging fruit in my opinion. And that's our local streets. Let's yeah. make them safe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, your, your local streets. And, and I paused on this just to, so we can give a little bit of a definition uh, to the sign itself. Uh, so auto to guest, auto as the guest, basically inferring to and, and instructing the driver that um, they need to be patient. They need to stay behind the, the people who are in front of them riding their bikes or in their wheelchair, et cetera, their mobility devices. Uh, again, this is a cycle priority uh, type of street, um, hence the, the term, you know, sort of the English version of it, of a bike priority street. Um, and I think it's really... I think you're bringing up a very, very good point of saying that it's like the backbone of the entire network. Uh, depending on the city in the Netherlands, somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of their cycle network is some form of shared space like this. And you'll you'll see. Oh, and you mentioned edge lane road. So l let's define that. So this is what we're talking about when we say edge lane road, uh, folks, and, and really 
it comes in different stripes, literally different stripes, <laughs> uh, and, and different versions of it. This is one version of it. Uh, you will off, oftentimes find these in rural environments, but you'll also see them within urban contexts. This one happens to be along a canal. Uh, but really what it is, is that motor vehicle traffic um, is, is kind of allowed in the area. Um, the 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 typical sort of, of feet or uh, edge lane road treatment it is it kind of operates like this where you have a uh, it's a yield street there's the motor vehicle travel lane is in both directions but it's narrow enough that uh, the drivers need to yield behavior and uh, yield to the others and so uh, it's it's one of those situations where we can't just say, well, oh, that's the Dutch, their culture, you know, we can't do this. I guarantee you in virtually any city in North America, you probably have a pre-World War II neighborhood that has narrow streets that function like a, um, that function like a, uh, like a yield street, you know, where, you know, you just have to be patient and let the other and figure it out. Um, and they've just formalized this. And it's not their favorite street design because they know that it, it has challenges to it. Mm-hmm. it, it, it and that oh, yeah, kind of yeah, goes in, without like saying. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot of things have to get r- go right for, for the edge, edge lane roads to really be effective. And um, and I mm-hmm. think the, the key thing to, to that is that they, you need volumes to be appropriate and you need speeds to be appropriate because it, once you mm-hmm. have high volumes and high speed, an edge lane road is just a frightening, frightening experience. You yeah, probably, I, I think you probably I mentioned found it in a one few of, of those. Videos. Yeah. Yeah. 60 kilometer edge lane roads. Yeah. No, thank you. I've ridden on one and I was like, that's enough. I, there was one in the Netherlands. I was like, I'm going to go across this small canal to that local street where everybody else is biking. Cause that's clearly a better place to bike. Yeah, the speed can't be that high. 30 kilometers, it's totally doable. But yeah, anything higher than that, it starts to get sketchy. And we're talking about people who are, you know, more confident. I'm not as confident as I was when I was a teenager, but again, AAA infrastructure. We're talking about for anybody who wants to be there should feel safe to be there pretty much. Yeah. The uh, other thing that you mentioned that I want to sort of emphasize too, because we mentioned the feet strut and we mentioned the edge lane roads, the other option that is there is um, is literally just the the local residential um, access streets. the The Dutch word for it, I will murder if I try to do it. They, it goes by uh, ETW is is the acronym that they they use for for that street. Uh, and those are the streets that may not have any signage saying feet strut. Uh, they may just be paved in bricks, um, giving that reinforcement that it's this is a slow street area. It's an access street only. It really sends a message to drivers and people riding bikes that this is a slow zone. And uh, again, one of those those three different typologies in the backbone of of, you know, access to uh, meaningful destinations, whether those are residential destinations or uh, business destinations. But to your point, they're almost all designed to reinforce 30 kilometers per hour or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it works to great effect. And you really see that because that's that's something you experience a lot of cities in North America and across the world is just the interaction between other road users, people in cars. When you're on a bike, you really notice quickly when you're on a bike or if you're just walking around how people driving cars see people outside of cars. This is something I was in Detroit last week. I didn't have a good experience. A lot of people just straight up not stopping for you. I almost got hit by a car on two occasions while walking. Uh, so it's something you have to be aware with. So when I was in the Netherlands, I think there's maybe three times I can count in those. I'm biking for hours and hours and hours for a week, three times where I thought that was, you know, that's some not good behavior that was a bit reckless. One of them being on a feed strat that was showing on screen earlier where a guy in an American pickup truck came blasting by well over the speed limit. Uh, maybe somebody not yielding to me while I was riding my bicycle. That was a close call twice. But again, it's 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 a far cry from what we experience here in North America, as we see in the numbers, right? Nick, yeah. what haven't uh, we discussed yet that you want to make sure to leave the audience with? 
I think I'd like to talk about what I plan to accomplish, or at least what I hope that my endeavors on YouTube do, if I can indulge the audience for a moment. Yeah, because you, you because you mentioned earlier, you, you mentioned, you know, in the beginning, I'm going to pull up your, your oldest videos. You mentioned really what you hope to accomplish when you were at this stage was, you know, giving some people some some tools to be able to inspire them to do that. How has that changed? What's your, what's your most recent interpretation of what you'd like to accomplish with the channel? Like I've already said, one of them is definitely to inspire people and get activism going so that we can change our physical environment. But more importantly, I'd like to tell people that I'm not a particularly talented or intelligent person. I consider myself a midwit. Okay. <laughs> so if I could inspire people, to, to, to are more intelligent, more talented than myself to get into this. This is not, this is not a zero sum game here. When we're talking this whole space, this urbanism space on YouTube or activism, this is synergistic. Okay. Get out there, make a video. If you think you could do better than me, please do it. And I hope you succeed because I, I said this to somebody earlier, if we can wave a magic wand and turn our cities into beautiful places that are safe and quiet and lovely places to live, places for people, I'll, I'll quit. Like, I have no reason because that's what I want, right? I want to plant the seed whose tree I will not enjoy the shade of. That old adage, however it goes, I know I just butchered it, but that's what I'd like to do, right? And I feel like that's what a lot of activists are doing in North America right now. They know there's no other places to live. They know there's places that they could move. Some, maybe some can, some can't, but there are places where you could really enjoy a wonderful place to raise your children or love a wonderful place for you to live, a wonderful place for you to retire and spend the rest of your life. But we, we got to change our place or else, you know, it's just going to be worse and worse. So it's great to see the movement change and see how much is gained this groundswell in all places around North America. It's, it's beautiful, really is beautiful. But please, I'm just want <laughs> go do it. I don't want to have to do this. I enjoy doing it. But if someone does it better than me, I will, I'm giving you the thumbs up. Anybody, please. <laughs> That's what I want to do. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I, I think I, given the fact that you have such a long history of, of starting YouTube channels, I, I think that, uh, yeah, you do get a, a certain amount of joy of, of doing this and, uh, and put it, pr producing the content and getting it out there. Um, yeah, if, if miraculously we were able to wave a, an active town's uh, wand that, you know, says, OK, here's here's the here's this the secret fairy dust that you can sprinkle over and we're going to get this all you know taken care of a it's not going to happen don't be holding out for yeah. that folks um <laughs> but even if that were the case I, I think that you would still be wanting to uh you know produce content about something uh and and with that being said i want to give some love to your your you and your your partners here on your podcast the radio free urbanism why don't you talk a little bit about uh, your your fine partners and characters that you have uh, on this uh, wonderful uh podcast that i was honored to be uh, featured on just 12 days ago yeah there you are episode 39 now this is a small little uh, podcast. We most of our listeners, most of our listeners are listeners. They're not watchers. We get a lot of people listening to the podcast. Not a lot of people watching the YouTube channel, but it's called Radio Free Urbanism. It's something I, I kind of started, and I, I reached out to other YouTubers who we were all very small at the time when we started. We were all about a thousand subscribers, so we've we've seen our growth together. It's been fun. Mainly, the podcast was a place for us to just vent our frustrations and be amongst people who share our values and our interest in the same thing. Cause you know, I don't have a lot of those people here as friends. So it's, it's a, it's a good experience for that. But basically the show is about urbanism stuff. That's what Alex says at the beginning of the show. And it's a weekly new show where we talk about the latest stuff in urbanism. Uh, Ethan, he's uh, climate and transit on YouTube. He makes obviously things about climate and transit, mainly trains and, and transit buses, stuff like that. So he's our transit quote unquote expert. Obviously, you know me. My name is Nick Laporte. I talk about market mobility and stuff. So that's my my niche on there. And Alex, he's kind of our, he's our guy. And I, I love Alex so much. And I feel like his channel doesn't get enough love. He makes great videos. He has this positive spirit that is just infectious. And I think he's somebody who can really motivate people to get out there and, and try to make change in their city. But yeah, he's a, kind of our pedestrian guy. Like he made a video about sidewalks, which is he made it interesting, which is, you know, how easy is that? I don't think that's very easy. So it was great to see. But yeah, we're looking for always looking for co-hosts. So guest co-hosts like yourself, other content creators in the YouTube space. And we occasionally interview people who are 
not content creators. And those are the kind of extra bonus episodes where we just talk to them about what they're doing, what they're up to and do kind of a standard interview. I think next we might have on, is it Patty, the bicycle mayor of Winnipeg? I think she's coming to join us next time, but yeah. Check I it love out. It. Yeah, no, ch- check it out, folks. I'll be sure to include the link uh, to this one as well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a T-shirt instead of a collared shirt on that. I, I, I dressed <laughs> down for the occasion. I think I was I was in good company there with that. I think so. Yeah, it, I hear what you're saying, though. It, it's, I think, really my passion of, of wanting to do this and shifting from being somebody who was in the trenches working on a lot of this stuff and working on behavior change to being a content creator was more along the lines of how do I reach the biggest audience possible? And so that's what this has really been kind of about. And and hopefully um, what I try to do with the Active Towns initiative is tell the positive story. It's really easy to be snarky. It's really easy to be clickbaity and negative and get traction. Um, we all know that. It's just not in my DNA. I can't do it. <laughs> Every once in a while, I try to do it a little bit, and I'm just like, eh, no, I, that just makes me feel <laughs> icky. Um, yeah. And so I, I try to, you know, really profile. I, I, I like to say I, I profile the people, the places, and the programs that are helping create a culture of activity. You fall in the into the, the category of the people who are out there doing stuff, creating content, you know, getting spreading the word. Uh, it has been such a joy to get to meet you in person there in Amsterdam and spend this hour chatting with you here today. Nick, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. You too, John. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Nick Laporte. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts here on the channel by becoming a Patreon member. Uh, hey, it's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org, click on the support tab at the top of the page, and there's several different Different options, including Patreon. The special bonus of becoming a patron is that you do gain access to all this content early and ad-free. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, help, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.